Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. We are excited to share that the Dr. GPCR Ecosystem 2.0 platform opens to all beta testers starting June 15, 2022. We plan on opening the ecosystem slowly to resolve any kind of kinks as soon as possible. You can visit us at ecosystem.drgpcr.com and explore the new site. Access is restricted to members of the GPCR field, and each sign-up will be approved based on one's involvement in the field. Once your sign-up is approved, you'll be able to enter the ecosystem. You'll also have the option to select a plan and get access to all things Dr. GPCR, including the upcoming Dr. GPCR Summit, access to new podcast episodes before they even get released to the general public, our new group discussion and forums, our new and improved job board, and Learning Center, where you'll be able to take a course or even prepare and share a course with your colleagues. Discover GPCR companies in one place and much more. Take advantage of everything that the new GPCR dedicated online playground has to offer today by visiting ecosystem.drgpcr.com and signing up. This is the only place where GPCR scientists, trainees, and GPCR organizations can thrive and where it's only about science and GPCRs. Think ResearchGate meets LinkedIn meets Amazon at the tip of your fingers. Visit ecosystem.drgpcr.com to start your journey today. Also, make sure that you mark your calendar for the third edition of the Dr. GPCR Summit. This year, the summit will be held between October 10th and 16th. Stay tuned for more soon. Visit ecosystem.drgpcr.com or visit our old website, which is still active, drgpcr.com, to explore everything that we've been doing in the past two years. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR, and today I am delighted to have with me Dr. Andrew Tobin from the University of Glasgow. Uh, Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Yamina. It's so nice to have you on. Well, it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for asking me. I'm I'm super excited to talk to you today. I've... uh, I was introduced to you by by Steve Ferguson, but I saw I was talking to Graham Milligan a couple of weeks ago, and he said, you have to talk to Andrew. And I told him, no worries, it's on the calendar. So I'm excited to to be talking to you today. Great, yeah. So let's let's start at the beginning. Um, Would you please walk us through a short, uh, you know, bio of your career as to where you started and where you are today? Well, I mean, it's a, um, it's, in in some respects a, a traditional and in other respects it's it's uh, it's an unusual career um if if you want me to get dial right back right back to uh, to when i started um when when i left uh, uh school to go to, to to university i think i think yeah mina it's true to say that my mother really wanted me to be a businessman and she didn't really want me to be a um a scientist, or didn't really have any notion of being a scientist at that stage, and so, uh, and so I applied for, I, I applied to be to be um, an ophthalmic um, sort of um, doctor in a way, which, and I failed dismally at that. I got rejected of all five uni- universities that I went to, and so then I took up a business uh, studies course at, uh, at what was then Leicester Polytechnic, um, and. Um, and and arrived there at, at nine in the morning and uh, and ready to rock and roll and found out the first lecture wasn't until eleven thirty and I wondered what I was going to do with my morning and so uh, so I, I, I was thoroughly rubbish at it to be honest with you and I left within a within six months before they they kicked me out um, but in that time I'd managed to get myself uh, enrolled at the University of Leicester on a chemistry degree which which I was delighted at and then I went around and got. Got got a lot of other offers off universities and decided to do a degree in biochemistry at um, at Queen Mary College, University of London. Uh, did really quite well, surprisingly well in that. Got, a, got myself a first class honours degree from there, and then left to work in a bank, which I was also rubbish at. Oh. And uh, <laughs> before they kicked me out of that, I decided to leave to do a PhD at Oxford, uh, followed by a postdoc. In um, at Bristol Myers uh, Squibb, which was called Squibb in those days, in Princeton, uh, 
um, before taking up a uh, postdoctoral position back at the University of Leicester, strangely enough, by coincidence. Um, so that was the be- that was the beginning, anyway. So, <laughs> and I've I've tried to, and it's just, it's strange we've come almost full full circle because I've actually just founded a a small biotech company called Celtic Pharma Therapeutics. So my mum got her way, as they will do in life. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. A business. I think you're the first guest who who had any encounter with the business world, or you know, worked in a bank. I've had people thinking about you know being an astronomer or being a physicist, and they ended up working on GPCRs and doing chemistry or biochemistry. Um, so this is a first, definitely on the podcast. Well, I think I think I think the 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 lesson, if there's any wisdom in in any of that, is, and this is what I tell my 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 own children, is is just to try stuff, and um, and if you don't enjoy it, then definitely leave. We are very privileged with a very privileged education and all the rest of it, so we need to use it in the best way we can, and and um, and so and so I encourage my my kids not to not to worry too terribly much, but do leave if you really are not enjoying it or. Um, and I've just in you know in that business studies course in Leicester, I was find myself reading nature, um, and <laughs> so, so really, <laughs> really I, I needed to I needed to focus on what what I really cared about, and uh, and and science is really um, really what I care about, and good science uh, is 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 what we try to do and try to promote in the lab, and so um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean it's very competitive though. We we after my postdoc um, in uh, in in with Mariana Barbasid, who taught me so much, so much uh, as due to 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 to, to Mariano's um, sort of uh, rigor, I think, in science and his determination. Um, um, he taught me really what it was to be to run a really highly successful research group. And we've tried to, to to replicate the success, maybe 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 not the style, but certainly the success that Mariano had, um, and um, and that led me to to apply for a Wellcome Trust uh, senior research fellowship, which I had um, three um, iterations of that, so fifteen years of Wellcome Trust funding. Really grateful to the Wellcome Trust for really launching uh, my career in terms of an independent scientist. And um, and so that's what uh, that's what happened immediately after my postdoc in Leicester. That's so interesting. So you made a very good point as to trying things and being able to admit to yourself that you don't like this or you're not actually good at it, and go out there and look for something that really feels like your home and you enjoy doing it. And I think a lot of a lot of trainees who listen to the podcast might be, and I was certainly one of them 20 years ago when I started. Uh, I always felt like I needed to be good at everything. And this was the only thing that I could be doing and nothing else. And fast forward 20 years, I don't work in the lab anymore. I still love GPCRs and I get to talk to people like you who actually, you know, the, who are the experts and I still relive or I'm, I feel very much part of the field without a pipette. Yeah, and I, I think that that's, so, I mean, we'll probably get on to um, the Advanced Research Center here at the University of Glasgow, which I'm a director of, and we had the opening of with David McMillan, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry um, uh, the, 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 in in, uh, in October, November time this uh, last year. Um, we care a lot about um, how we nurture people's careers in the lab and I think Yamina you're a very good example of a of a person that's um that's gone to high quality labs produced high quality research but then haven't moved on to be a professor group leader or whatever and the reality is is that the vast majority of quality scientists that are with us young people will not go through to run their own research groups and um and so we have uh, what we call a lab of academic culture, which is really addressing in an honest way, the way that careers go and to really promote the success of people like yourself and others that do not necessarily go on to run a research group. And, um, and you know, I mean, I hope that you enjoyed yourself in, in, in New York and, and all the things that you've done, but, um, 
but you know this is a moment in time when you're when you're in a research environment where you can do research which and and open open the box of things that people have never seen before even if it's just a tiny hydrogen bond to uh to you know that nobody's seen but at least that's a moment of discovery and then move on and make a self uh, a, a a fulfilling worthwhile career which does not necessarily involve direct research and and so and so that's what we're trying to do in glasgow be much more mindful of that and and um and purposeful in promoting young people's careers beyond the bench and um yeah yeah i think we just need to do more of that i think so too i think so too and to answer your question i loved my time at the bench i really really loved i ran hundreds and thousands of bread plates and flow cytometry <laughs> samples and it was difficult but it was rewarding i very much enjoyed doing everything i've done and i got to a point where i said to myself i'm done i need to have a top view of the research and me being at the bench wasn't cutting it and you know it was a difficult decision for me to make because i i would like to think that i was fairly good at it i wasn't excellent and i really enjoyed it but um i enjoyed doing this much more this is such a rewarding experience here sitting with guests and talking about their career and their work yeah and i think i think that message needs to get out maybe we'll bring you into the arc to tell people that story because i would I love that <laughs> I think it's I think it is I think because I mean I I'll, I'll be very careful here because I know this is getting broadcasted but but sometimes people feel that if they don't go on for to carry on research that's somehow a failure in some way and um and that is a barrier that we need to to just to, to you know that's a lie that we need to to dispel let's just not true I was I was one of those people and sometimes I I went to recently to the Great Lakes GPCR retreat and I gave a talk about Dr. GPCR and I I I, I don't want to say I felt inadequate but I had I felt like I needed to justify why I was there giving the talk and my first sentence was you know I grew up at this meeting I came here as a master's student and I've worked with this person in the audience and that person in the audience and I published and I did all of these because I felt like I needed it's a cultural thing we need to get beyond that and really tell the junior scientists the trainees that it's okay yeah to i think find your passion I, i think that's absolutely right and i think that i think that we um that i think that i think that what we have to understand and i think you do understand that when you become um as aged as i have <laughs> is, experienced <laughs> <laughs> thank you you're very kind um is is that is that we are all part of a big machine and um and i i learned this from my postdoc um lev solyakov who i'd love if he was listening to this i mean and uh, cuz he's such a uh, such an inspiring person and mentor in many respects to me lev lev's older than myself and um and lev would get very um cross with me he's russian of course and let level get very cross with me if i went into the lab and i and i said to him that this is my lab lev it's 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 i can do whatever i want right i mean i i'm running the lab and he said andrew your job is to be in the office write grants and write papers go away and do that <laughs> <laughs> and i sort of learned from lev that 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 i wasn't actually very important at all i had a job like everybody else in the team and that just my job happened to be the guy who wrote the grants and gave the talks right and uh, and that was just what i what i did and um and so and so we all have a role in this in this venture which is pushing forward uh the frontiers of uh, human knowledge in um in science and um and i happen to be running a group a research group you need to at your current role you mean uh, communicate that and connect us and do this so we've all got if we if one of us falls falls down here the 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 machine breaks so i think that that's the way to look at it rather than uh, have some sort of weird hierarchical structure uh, and um so that's that's just my personal opinion i couldn't agree more i think it makes a lot of sense and i think it's important and every little piece of that machinery is important and that's that's how things get discovered 
And it's yeah. not one person in a dark lab in the middle of the night, you know, curing cancer. It's no. all of us putting in the little little work over time and it's the accumulation of of, of that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely absolutely. So 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 each thing needs to be valued in the way that it that you you know, and unfortunately human beings value things in slightly different ways. So if you're <laughs> if you're, you know, David Beckham, you get all the uh, all the credits <laughs> for scoring the goal. Or if you're if from yeah. my end of the world, it's Jamie Vardy. But we won't go into the football now. But the uh, but uh, but but you know somebody has got to pass him the ball, and uh, and yes. uh, and that's that, that's the that's a Take well well worn analogy. <laughs> we'll leave it there. All right, let's 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 go a little bit back in time. So you mentioned your mom wanted you to be in finance and in business. As a teenager or as a child, was there any profession that you were interested in? What were you good at, at sc- in school? Oh, wow. Uh, <clears throat> I was always good at science. The, 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 first, the first time I achieved anything in school, and I didn't achieve a lot, um, was in a physics lesson. Um, and, and I suddenly realized that actually I was not sort of towards the bottom end of the class, which is where I ended up most of the time. But, but, but actually, I was actually quite good at it. And, it, and I surprised myself. Um, and um, we moved a, around a lot um, as, as kids. My mum my and dad, um, my dad got promoted in various ways um, during my childhood. So we sort of changed school a lot. So, so I spent most of my time just grappling with, with, with the pressures of, of being the new kid in, in school. <laughs> And um, and making sure that I supported the right football team, so I didn't get into too much trouble. But but the um, and so and so it was a bit of a revelation to me that I was actually half good at something. We have we have a thing in the UK at, when I was growing up called the eleven plus. All you UK people listening to this will know that. And basically, that was the way that the British government um, separated the. The haves and the have-nots at eleven years of age, and uh, and and yeah, I mean, I mean, this is going to be a big sob story. So you can get a violin out now. So you 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 <laughs> so, 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 so you mean uh, this is not this? I, I wasn't put in for the eleven plus. I wasn't smart enough for this, which is an extraordinary thing when you think about it. So this is this goes back to something I care about a huge amount, which is the leveling up agenda. Because we should not be rejecting kids at eleven plus, eleven years of age, um, which is essentially the, U- the UK system at that stage. And so, if you pass the eleven plus, you went to some fancy schools called grammar schools, and um, and you got groomed for 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 being things like the prime minister and stuff. And um, and and the the reality is is that we just miss a huge amount of talent. So 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 that was where I was, and so we didn't go to I didn't get to to, to do really sort of high end science until um, I was sort of 16, 17, when I was able to get myself onto, um, onto what they call A-levels in the UK, which is, uh, I guess, equivalent, I'm, I'm guessing higher as in the US, but, but the, um, and, um, and, so, um, and so I never really found, but, but I remember in a biology class, uh, this realization that, the, that, that chemistry and biology come together and um, and it was looking at lipids, and and the chemist, the biology teacher at that time introduced me to this idea that these were actually molecules and that they came from chemical reactions, and I just thought, wow, that is incredible, and I've just loved biochemistry ever since then. Uh, but was I the sort of kid that went around the garden and collected toads and looked at looked at spiders making webs and stuff like that? I don't think I was that sort of sort of kid, but. Um, but I definitely, um, I definitely got the science bug from being it was something I was good at at school, and um, and then uh, and then I was, as I say, I was then I was really bad at business, and then I got myself a first in biochemistry. So, how do you work out what what you're good at? I think the world has got to find out what kids are good at, and just just go for it, and 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 we've got to find out these kids from underprivileged or i say underprivileged backgrounds you know i i my, my i can't say my father and mother were underprivileged but they were they were um nurses that looked after what we call special needs adults now 
um, which used to be called mentally handicapped adults. So basically people that were institutionalized at that stage. You do not get a lot of money if you're a nurse in that game. And so we didn't have a lot of money in our family and uh, books weren't a major thing. And, um, and so, you know, there's a whole load of talent out there that we are just missing. Yes. I, and I couldn't agree with you more on this one. This is something that I'm very passionate about, but the fact that the system created, I mean, I went to school in Algeria. I went to school in Romania in a Hungarian class, then moved to Canada and all in all of these countries I went to school in a different language so I had to learn how to write you know from right to left and left to right and I did spend my childhood similarly to you trying to fit in as the new kid in a new environment and new thing and I don't know I think I I really pushed myself but now I'm, I'm thinking about in general about at the school system it is a box and if you don't fit in the box as a child then you get on the sides and no one actually thinks about evaluating those children in a different manner. We're all good at something, but we don't have the tools or we, there is, the system doesn't allow parents and, and teachers to evaluate those kids in different, a different perspective. And I think you're the per- perfect example for that. Everybody yeah, think- is, you know, everybody is expected to be good at everything as a, as a child. And then you get to specialize, but for example, the way you learn is different. Some people are more visual. Some people are, but other people need to practice. Other people need a little bit of help and they can do it. And that's unfortunately not being accommodated in the school system in general. No, that's right. And 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 we have in the UK, and I think, I think you know, I, I believe from my experience of the US that, um, that it's slightly more hidden, but it's but it's there. There's no question. I mean, we we went. I I did my I did I did my PhD eventually in Oxford, and um, and this is an incredibly privileged environment, which you are not equipped for if you come from what we call a state school, a comprehensively educated child, <laughs> walking into. And now I'm going to get myself in trouble because you're going to put this out worldwide <laughs> uh, into a place called Magdalen College in 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 uh, Oxford. Um, you know, that is not, that's just a seat of learning. It's just a seat of knowledge, but you cannot, you you, you do not feel comfortable in that environment from, if you come from one of the um, tougher areas of Glasgow, let's put it that way. Yet you may be as bright, potentially brighter than the kids that are actually there from, uh, from better, from better schools. Is that a system which is drawing out the best scientists, the best politicians, the best businessmen? Well, you know, now we're getting into a really yep. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but 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 like you, you know, I mean, I, I you know, coming from a bit of a background like that, you show up in my lab. Um, we we are definitely do not care about your background, about your your color, about your gender identification about those sorts of things. I I am very sensitive about judgment in those areas. Um, What I will judge you on is your effort. Yep. And I think that that's very important to put out there. That's important. And at the end of the day, you need data, you need to produce something, but science is 90% times failure, but the effort matters. That's right. I, I I honestly think that, and I hope that you know you'd ha- you'd have to come to my group and talk to my group uh, uh, about that rather than listen to me what I think of myself because that's not a very <laughs> good judge. But but the um, but in many respects we are not. I mean we are not a charity. I mean I do some 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 charitable work. We are not a charity in the lab, so we do have to we do have to we 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 are um, recipients of very valuable grant funding from usually from charities or from the UK taxpayer or European taxpayer so um so I'm very conscious that we are not here just to um just to fill our lab books with interesting bits of information we have to actually produce something that's going to be yeah. worthwhile and publishable um so so that's it are we all uh does it always work well the answer is of course no it doesn't no agreed agreed and it's, it's so interesting having gone to university and in Canada and now living in the U.S., I see what you mean about, you know, state university versus Ivy League institution here in the U.S. And this is something un- I, I cannot comprehend 
this. There are so many universities, so many schools here in the U.S. that in my mind is just why are they, you know, why is Ivy League University X so valued versus, you know, state university? I, I grew up in Montreal, so to me it was, you know, McGill, University of Montreal, there's two other universities, but ne I never felt like one is better than the other or that, wow. that there is that disparity in in universities. You go out outside of Canada and you tell people I'm from Montreal and I went to school in Montreal. The first question I get is, did you go to McGill? And I say, well, <laughs> no, University of Montreal. But the reason was because I was growing up in a francophone area and I, I honestly never thought about going to McGill. And that's I, I, that. Well, well, you're talking, I mean, you're, you're talking a foreign language here to me because I know great research in McGill and the University of Montreal. Exactly. And, 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 so, and so I didn't know there was, on, to be honest with you, I didn't know that there was some sort of class distinction between the two. Um, From the US, not in Canada. Is that right? Well, I'm not surprised because, yeah, that would be, I mean, you really are picking around the edges if I <laughs> no, those, two, those two institutions, but there you go. But but I never I never understood this distinction. To me, going to university was to learn something, get a degree, and then become so, you know a specialist in something. And it didn't matter what university you came from. But here in the U.S., there was this distinction as to Ivy League versus non-Ivy League, which yeah. is unfortunate because access to Ivy League universities is somewhat restricted or there is that extra barrier that you were mentioning all right let's let's stop here about this and let's move back to you and to gpcr so when did you first hear about gpcrs well it's um well my phd was in uh looking at serotonin receptors in the iris ciliary body of the rabbit everybody listening to this would have read all my papers in experimental eye research uh and um so that would have been uh, that would have been that and um, then I went to to Bristol Myers to to, to, to Mariano uh, lab, who just moved to to Squib, um, to look at oncogenes um, and to look at uh, to discover um, whatever those oncogenes were, and they were being revealed at that time with all the RAS and SARC and all the others. Um, and then I th thought that the GPCR field could do with with the application of the molecular techniques that I'd been learning in the oncogene field uh, to reveal then, as they were being revealed extraordinarily, the nature of the actual receptors themselves and the fact that they were um, individual genes and individual proteins. So from that point of view, um, you know, raising antibodies in rabbits and cloning and expression in 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 uh, in in vitro systems and the like was absolutely new in the GPCR field, and we brought that to Leicester, and um, and then that was when it solidified. So I think I've always wanted to really do cancer research, strangely enough, but I've just always been drawn back to what the GPCRs have been doing. And although we keep on butting up against cancer research, because uh, I think still GPCRs as well uh, is, is not, you, you know, we haven't exploited these receptors in terms of cancer biology, but, um, but nonetheless, um, it just opened up this huge vista of opportunities. And then of course the drug uh, discovery world just went crazy for GPCRs when they found out that they could screen them so easily in, in recombinant systems and the like. And um, and so and so that's when my career really took off in terms of regulation, phosphorylation, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things that uh, we very much grabbed hold of the coattails of, you know, all the, all the great people out of the left of its group. And, mm -hmm. uh, but if I start mentioning scientists, I'm going to get into trouble. So we're just, we, we all know, we all know who we're talking about. Many of them are at the University of Montreal and McGill as well. So, uh, so we'll see. Uh, but the, um, and, um, and so, and so I just think it's just, and I still think that we are scratching the surface. I think that we got uh, sort of seduced, if you like, with the ease of looking at single transduction in the in vitro systems. And now, of course, with all the application of these fantastic genetic tools, as well as more access to human tissue samples, uh, understanding understanding the, um, the uh, activity and function of these receptors in the context of real tissue and disease is now possible. And um, and that's opening up a whole new way of looking at this receptor class. So, and of course, all the structural biology. So it just went on and on and on, just giving um, this this area. And um, and so you know, I I can't see 
any type of biomedical scientist would just be completely enthralled with by the opportunities that GPCRs give. Great. Great. And it's so interesting. So bef before I comment on what you just mentioned, I have one other question. Um, <clears throat> after your PhD, what made you go into a postdoc in industry? Because I think this is also something that junior scientists might want to hear about. Some Most of the time, people don't think about, okay, I'm going to finish my PhD and do a postdoc in industry. I'm just going to go to another academic lab. Is there anything, uh, any reason was... why you chose that? And what did you learn out of that? Well, I mean, it's a complete accident, of course. I mean, I applied to Mariano's lab. I mean, basically what I did was I looked in annual reviews of biochemistry and I picked Michael Bishop and all these big sort of superstars. And um, and I wrote to them and said, can I have a job? And um, and Mariano wrote back and said, yes, I can. you can have a job, but I'm not in the National Cancer Institute. I'm just leaving that in Maryland. Um, I'm going to set up this jewel in the crown basic research facility in this in this company called Squib. And um, and I thought, wow! And they they just come out with Captopril at that time, which is an ACE inhibitor for for hypertension. The company had loads of money, and uh, and Mariano um, just got everything that he wanted, including a photocopier, which was amazing. Wow! Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which and, back in the day was very <laughs> important to have because you could find the photocopy. Believe, the believe me, he almost left the company because he wasn't going to get a photocopier. But anyway, we're going to <laughs> so uh, so he um, and it was just a fantastic time. So was I really in industry? I don't think I was. Mm -hmm. um, I think I really followed Mariano, and um, and and it was just a great decision. Now, I mean industry and academia are now drawing so close together that there is in if you choose well there is a real opportunity to um to feel very comfortable as a sort of fundamental researcher within certain companies yeah. i think so too i think so too and you so see I, people going back and forth as well which is which is which is really good if we can I, th I think so too because there was a time where where it was a one way street you know, you were considered going to the dark side of, yeah. of science, which I don't think it's the case anymore. And I think it's important to understand that it is not. And I think it's two sides of the same coin when it comes to academia versus versus industry. And I was just thinking, you know, you mentioned all these tools and screening and understanding the biological function of GPCRs in tissues and patient derived, you know, tissues. And I think doing the cell signaling in hex cells to looking at GPCR function in tissues is all part of the same Rubik's cube. We need to understand what the function is in physiological and pathophysiological settings of these GPCRs. And all of these steps are important in order to get that data, in order to have that view of how receptors function and how we can target these receptors. I absolutely agree. I mean, I mean, if I can promote our own research at this Please. point, I mean, we, I mean, we just we just uh, published a paper in Cell just before Christmas, and um, and and that was in collaboration with Sose Heptaris, which people will know as the as a as a as, a, as one of the strongest biotech companies in the GPCR field, and um, and there the nuances of the pharmacology, which which hit the sweet spot for a muscarinic agonist to have efficacy at the central um, sites of the of the M1 and M4 muscarinic receptors, whilst having less of an effect on the peripheral receptors, is all around efficacy and selectivity, which can only really get its um, get its roots in understanding you know, a deep understanding of pharmacology, which comes from academic research. Yeah. Uh, but it was beautifully applied in that, uh, in that study from with Sosa Heptaris and, um, and just shows that the blend of knowledge and then the effort that a company can put in and the multiple structures that they can throw at it. And the fact that when you've got investors, which are putting in tens of millions of pounds, how you can actually progress things. And then working out what you can and cannot publish, and um, and knowing the value of of putting stuff out in the scientific literature. So I think that you know people like Chris Tate and Fiona. Oh, I'm going to start mentioning names now, but Chris Tate, <laughs> and Fiona Marshall, yep. and yep. people like that who set up who set up that whole idea of Hectaris to have that commercial 
angle, but understand the value of uh, fundamental science and uh, and publishing and being involved in the in the more sort of academic end of it just brought such rewards to 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 Heptaris at the time and now Sosai Heptaris that um, that I'm sure I'm sure uh, Yamina yeah, when you get Fiona on these things and she's probably already been on <laughs> yes yeah uh, yeah. I'm, I'm that. yeah okay Good. sorry Fiona but anyway <laughs> um, uh, I'll go back and listen to that podcast but but yeah I mean those are the people that really yeah. have, have transformed the um, the interaction between industry and academia. Yeah, and uh, you and I mentioned I've had Fiona on very early on. I actually recorded in my car the first summer when I started the podcast because that was the only place where I could get quiet. And I also had Chris Tate on, and I kind of got the the um, two 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 versions or their own versions of how they came into working together and how Heptaris was initially um, built. Yeah, what a, story. Early. what a what a what a great story. I think so too. I think yeah. so too. So what is your favorite GPCR? You mentioned muscarinic receptors. Do you have a favorite one? Well, we had this. We had this. Uh, Arthur Christopoulos and I went to the Wellcome Trust and uh, and um, and we said that we were going to work on M1 and M4 muscarinic receptors. And they said, well, look, it's way too, way, too, way too much for your collaborative award. This is in front of the Wellcome Trust committee, bless them. And they were sitting there. It's all high-powered and we all wore suits and all that sort of thing. And... Um, and so at that time, I saw that the M1 receptor was, was going to give us the most leverage in, in terms of the tools that we had and all the rest of it. And, um, and, and so they asked us this question. And I know that Arthur wants M4. And so it's just like, well, now you've got the two leaders and one's going to say M1 and one's going to say M4. And then they talked about Sophie's choice in this uh, little thing, okay, <laughs> which, which was actually sort of a really weird spin on something because we're also a key worker for us and a collaborator now and currently an employee of Sose Heptaris is Sophie Bradley, who was really instrumental in a lot of the work we were doing. And so it really was Sophie's choice, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and, so, and so at the time I thought M1 and Arthur thought M4. And I'm moving a little more towards um, M4. The really nerdy question, though, is what is your favorite phosphorylation site? And, uh, and, and yeah, that's right. You go, ooh. And, so, and it's the sort of, you, you talked about Gordon conferences. And I sat there with Chris Langmead and a few others. And I said, yeah, yeah, what's your favorite phosphorylation site? This is sort of after two or three whiskeys and all the rest of it. But so, so it is going to be. So I'm afraid I will go probably M1. And definitely 228 is my favorite phosphorylation site in the M1. So there we go. <laughs> well, again, this is the first, I think, um, typically the answer is I don't have a favorite GPCR or actually it's not a GPCR, it's a G protein. But the phosphorylation site, I think you just took the podcast to the next <laughs> next level. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include <laughs> I'm going to include this definitely in, in the next set of questions. Do you have a favorite phosphorylation site? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We, we we could even even go nerdier and ask: Do you have you know a um, a domain, a favorite domain, or a, do, a favorite um, um, you know a motif in receptors? Well, okay, we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> this, is really, this is really getting sad now. Everybody can go away and do something else in their lives if they're listening to this. Um, I think, um, well, strangely enough, I mean, I mean, um, Bob Lefkowitz once told me when I was looking at the M3 muscarinic receptor, which we did a lot of work on, and I sh should really, uh, it, it, you, you know, when are you going to work on a on a receptor that that's going to make a difference? Type of thing is what uh, what Bob was. About. <laughs> it's very. And so Bob. I would I would go. <laughs> sorry, Bob, but you did say that. I, I would I would go with. The the third intracellular loop of the M3 muscarinic receptors, my favorite domain. We made we made a GST fusion protein. We made, I made it, um, expressed it like crazy, cut it out of a gel, stuck it, stuck it into a rabbit, and got the most amazing GPCR antibodies that we've ever had. And uh, and they were highly selective. Um, and um, and then we looked at the phosphorylation and I did the mass spec, and we did so much work. And then to my horror, to my absolute horror, when they started to do structural biology, and I knew nothing about structural biology, I still don't, but the, uh, is that they cut off all those domains. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, my favorite thing in the whole world has been replaced by lysozyme or something else or whatever. Yeah. And um, so let's, let's put a banner up for the third intracellular <laughs> loop and let's do big third intracellular loops like the M3 <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing.
<laughs> All right. I know that we have to stop at the top of the hour, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And um, I think we all agree that GPCRs are still good drug targets. But um, what are your thoughts? Why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I think that we are just beginning to understand the biology within the disease context. Um, the problem with GPCRs is that nature has used them in many, many different ways. The same receptor subtype, of course, is expressed both centrally, peripherally, and all sorts of ways. So obviously, the selective targeting of those is going to be the key thing. I think that if we're making any contribution at all, is to understand that, that nature is using these proteins as a very flexible single transduction mechanism, which is engaging in single transduction pathways in a very selective way, in a tissue and cell specific way. Um, that, um, that through um, pharmacological understand, understanding the pharmacological properties that drive particular single transduction in particular cellular settings is going to help. And that doesn't necessarily mean the traditional sense of bias, but it could mean that bias is based on PK, kinetics. I think that people like Brian Roth is really doing some amazing work in these areas. And, um, and, and, and being able to capture that in terms of design, dr drug design, which is being helped by structural biology. So are we, we, we are just lifting the lid on that. I think that what we need to do as a field is to understand that Jim Black, way back in the day, was probably one of the most successful uh, drug discovery people in the GPCR field. And he barely believed that the receptors were individual proteins and genes themselves. So whilst we gain all this knowledge and we gain the nuances and even to the extent of, you know, atomic level interaction with the ligands, in some way we've got to beam out into the bigger picture and say, how is that really informing us in terms of drug discovery? Because I think the more we learn, it's not necessarily resulting in more effective uh, drug discovery programs. In fact, I think that that's just borne out in the literature that that's the case. So I think in some way we need almost like a philosophical discussion around how much knowledge do you need <laughs> to generate genuine drug discovery? Because I don't think there's any question that this is a receptor family which has only just started to yield its uh, benefits in terms of therapeutic uh, potential. Um, but I think the, the, the effort is to say more information, more information, more information. If we can get more information, we're going to be, we're going to be better placed. And um, I guess that there's a sort of a bit more of a philosophical discussion around how much information we, what type of information we need, and then how do we apply it? And uh, I think that that's partly what we're trying to do in Celtic Pharma is the, is, you know, we've got some fantastic GPCR targets um, where we've juxtapositioned that, well, where nature has juxtapositioned the receptor in the epithelial lining of the gut, for example, where it may well be regulating gut permeability. And then right alongside that, the same receptor is in uh, immune cells, which are regulating the immune system of the drug. You get a drug, it's going to hit both those receptors in both those cellular contexts. So, you know, let's work out with industry, and we are doing this with industry as well, how that, how we can system specifically target these GPCRs to do what we want them to do. And I, fi I finally, a final thought on that is that we've got a very exciting program around free fatty acid receptors at the moment. The free fatty acid receptor 4 GPR 120 is one of our favorite ones. The ligands for that are traditionally thought of as being um, coming from our diet and their omega-3 fatty acids, for example, from fish oils and the like. This receptor is found in the lung. And this receptor regulates the contraction of airway smooth muscle and inflammation in the lung. And so we've got a grant for all those people looking at our MRC grant at the moment. We've got a grant out there that is saying, can we use, can that be a validated therapeutic target in inflammatory human lung disease? And then one set of people are saying, yes, but what's the natural ligand? And we're saying, we are not going to do those two things. How the biology and the natural ligand works is incredibly important and incredibly interesting, but maybe is not related to, is it a good therapeutic target? So you can see how knowledge in one doesn't necessarily need to go hand in hand with knowledge of the other. No, I agree. I agree. And, and I think that the, these questions need to be asked 
at the initiation of the project. When you think about a disease state, when you think about a GPCR and you need to define what is the question that you're trying to answer? Are you trying to learn the biology and it doesn't matter where that takes you? Or are you trying to exploit this GPCR as a drug target? And what are the questions that you need to answer in order to come up with a molecule or antibody or a therapy, any type of therapeutic? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I mean, there, I mean, obviously there's a blend in there, isn't there? There's a big, there's a big gray area in there, but it is, it is knowing exactly what you said there, knowing, knowing what it is that you want to get out of this pro- project and, yes. um, and, and potentially more and more knowledge I mean, knowledge is always useful. I'm not, I'm not going to argue against knowledge, but um, but but you know, at some point, we need to land this in a in 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 a place where we can actually generate some new drugs. Yes, yes, agreed. And I think this is a, a nice time for us to stop. I still had two more two more questions that I asked from everyone. I think we need to reschedule another 15 minutes in order to satisfy. Well, why, why, don't you, why don't you just count? Why don't you why, why, okay. why are you asking those questions now? Perfect. Then, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, those, we're, People can wait. It's okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So we've talked a little bit at the beginning about you know being in the right field and making the choices <sighs> or that in in a career choice in which you feel comfortable and you like to do. What are other um, what is another advice that you would have for junior scientists in order to, you know, contribute to the field, but also do what they, what they love best? Wow. Okay. Advice, advice. I mean, this is, this is really, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is real take it or leave it advice. Please do not think that this is, that I'm some sort of pool of wisdom in, in here. Cause I, I don't feel as if I'm that at all. Um, I, I, uh, I, but the first thing I would say is never blame your supervisor. Okay, <laughs> be <the> supervisor. <laughs> never, never blame him or her uh, 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 about that. But do, but do, but do, do take control. Uh, do, do feel as if life is within your control, and that if your supervisor is not going in the direction they need to go in, and this happens no matter what level, including my own level, I won't work for somebody that I cannot align with. Um, and um, and so, so so either change them or leave. Those are the two things that I would do generally in life. Um, in terms of in terms of science, um, I would encourage it as a moment in time when you can actually make a contribution in terms of um, in terms of you know the research contribution you're going to make. So 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 um, so in other words, I would go for it. Um, and, um, and what I keep saying to the lab and they probably hate me for it is if we're going to fail, fail big, um, don't, don't fail small. And, um, cause I was once, uh, there's, there's a fantastic guy in the, uh, protein kinase area, protein kinase C, uh, Peter Parker, his name is out of, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the UK. And, um, and and I, I I said to him that these are that we had loads of phosphorylation sites in the third intracellular loop of the receptor, and I, it was too difficult to uh, to mutate them all. And, and he said, "Why? Why is that?" And I'm like, "Well, I, well, I don't know. It's a lot of work, Peter, and I don't know." And he said, "Come on, get you you know get going here." And so it is that sense of, and I think the the U.S. scientists really do 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 get this, just. Just go for that big question. Just, just, just go for it. And if if you if you make make it, then then great. And if you don't don't make it, well, at least you at least you gave it a go. But but being um, but being a bit timid in the side science area is that is something that I think we should uh, we should avoid. And um, I don't know if there's any more advice really. And when it when it comes, you know, don't, don't don't be too precious about things, and don't don't become one of those horrible scientists that are just so loving themselves that they uh, that they um you know they lose perspective of uh, a bit of humility all right <laughs> last question um top three aha moments that you had a sign as a scientist that shaped your trajectory it doesn't have to be science specific but anything that you know um you experienced that determined your trajectory anything that ex- <laughs> experience that um i think but- yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was yeah, just yeah. gonna say. I think the fact that you you went into into business school and the class started two a half two and a half hours later, um, was potentially a moment where you were like, "Am I in the right place? Is this what I really <laughs> want to do?" At least that that's that's how I would interpret it. 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, the thing is, is that I guess that I, I, I'm going to beam all the way back to a um, to a, to a, uh, a, a a experience that I had doing Saturday work um, in a place called Marley Home Care, which was uh, which is basically a outlet for kitchens and stuff like that, and I really really hated it. And, um, and I, and it would, and literally I was only there for about seven hours and literally the, the, there was a clock outside and it would chime on every, on the quarter hour. And it felt like every quarter hour was like five hours. I've never, and I, I vowed I would never work in, in a business that I, that was like that, that I just, that I just saw time go part by and so slowly. I can honestly say, Yamina, that, I never felt that when going into work. In fact, in fact, I'm sad enough to be sad on a Friday when the week is over. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and my wife says, you're just a workaholic. And I don't think it, I don't think that's true. I think I was trying to work it out this morning. I don't think that's true. I just think I just love it. I love the people. I love t- chatting to you. This has been a real delight. Um, I, I, and I, and I, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to go into the lab. I just I just enjoy it. I get tired sometimes. Everybody gets tired, and sometimes I have to do some stuff that I'm not that keen on doing. But but um, but basically, I, I just like getting up in the morning and doing this job. So um, so whilst that's still going to happen, I'll carry on if they if they continue to pay me. I'll probably do it when they're not paying me as well. <laughs> I think this is a nice a nice way to to stop this, and I completely agree with you. Uh, it doesn't feel like work. I, I, it's, it's, I, we started our podcast episode at 6 a.m. I was up at five telling myself, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> but then, then honestly, I leave these conversations energized. Yeah, great. No, that's the, you're doing the right thing. I, I, I love it. And I'm, I'm so glad that I was able to find this path and realize that I love to do this. I live for this. <laughs> I, I do. I, I leave energized. It's just amazing. I get to meet so many people and, yeah. and enjoy these conversations and, you know, forge these friendships. And it's, I feel privileged to be able to talk to you and to uh, all our guests. Yeah, no, you're doing a great job. And, and as I say, we, it's, 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 it's so important that these, that, uh, that we have great communicators. So, so well done for setting all this up. Thank you. Thank you. With this, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed talking to you, <clears throat> and I will let you go to the lab. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this Dr. GBCR podcast episode. I'd like to thank our guest, as well as our team members, Attila Forrest and Ines Pinero. Become a beta tester today and sign up for the new and improved Dr. GPCR Ecosystem 2.0 at ecosystem.drgpcr.com. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter, find us on YouTube, and if you're like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions, email us at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.